Our next speaker is um, Jason Spadaro from Old Dominion University. Uh, thank you. Actually, now I'm going to talk about something uh, very similar, uh, but with a different species. So there's been a lot of attention paid to diadema in the Caribbean as kind of a keystone function or a keystone species for its function, um, grazing on the reefs. However, we've, we've heard and I think ad nauseum that there's a lot of logistical um, difficulty in, in reintroducing and restocking them after their, their massive mortality event. Um, so we kind of decided a while back to, uh, to investigate the utility of, of other species that may provide this critical function and may not be um, quite as apparent um, as diadema. And we, we went with the biggest crab in the Western Atlantic. This is Magwamithrax spinosismus. The unfortunate genus is now named for Toby Maguire as Spider-Man. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's the largest crab in the Western Atlantic. This is me holding a large male in the Florida Keys where they get, where they're the smallest individuals in the Caribbean. Um, and they get up to about three kilograms and uh, up to almost 18 centimeters in carapace width. They're, they're enormous. Um, and they eat a lot of algae. Uh, so <clears throat> we decided to test that. We found a very degraded reef system and decided to uh, go for these you know, not out on the main reef track, but kind of look at the at the uh, algal dominant systems on these inshore uh, coral patch reefs. And just to kind of give a, an, or a reference for size, these are boats in the satellite photo over top. And these dark areas are little isolated coral patch reefs. And they range in size from about the size of this lectern to uh, about the size of this room. Um, and they're great for this kind of density manipulation experiment because they're isolated, they're replicable, they're easily manipulated, and they're just beautiful experimental units. Um, <clears throat> and we were looking at a very similar situation where outplanting these crabs, manipulating their density, and looking at their effect on the, benthic the structure of the benthic community, particularly algal cover. Um, so we, we selected 12 of these here off of uh, Lower Matacum Bay, and on four of them, we did nothing. We, we left them as a negative control. On another four, we outplanted crabs to the same density that we've seen before for, um, for diadema outplant experiments, where I put one individual per meter square of surface area. Um, and then on a third set of four reefs, we manually denuded them of, of macroalgae and then dumped the crabs out there to see if uh, do we need to outplant crabs and they'll knock the algae down or do we need to give them a little head start, wipe the algae out and then they'll maintain it? Um, so every month for, uh, for a year after that, <clears throat> um, I came back and took 10 uh, random, you know, haphazardly placed approximately one meter square photo quadrats at the bottom and used those uh, to, uh, with the point intercept model to uh, um, track changes in, in the benthic community structure. Um, and just the macroalgae data, here those are, let me orient you, this is percent cover of macroalgae along the vertical axis and then across the, uh, the horizontal axis here are the different um, sampling events. There are two missing because weather was nasty in uh, November and February. Um, so just in the controls, you can see that, that algal cover was in incredibly high. We, we, we stayed between 70 and 90 percent cover on each of these reefs. Um, but then by just adding crabs, we, we affected almost an 85% reduction in the cover of macroalgae. Um, um, and then on the reefs where we scrubbed and then put the crabs out, we, we saw a similar substantial reduction in the cover of macroalgae and then maintained that uh, condition for at least 12 months. Um, one of the other exciting results was we went back two years later and did a visual census of coral recruits. So anything less than about uh, two and a half centimeters in diameter or less than 25 coralites. And <clears throat> there was a stark difference on, re and this is just reefs that did and did not receive crabs. Um, and so on, on reefs which received crabs, there was almost a tripling of, uh, of the number of coral recruits per reef. Um, another kind of, interesting and, and serendipitous uh, effect we were seeing was that on reefs that we did not add crabs to, our, our negative controls, and early on in the reefs that, that did receive crabs, 
there were many fewer fish and many fewer fishes um, than on reefs that we manually denuded of macroalgae or later on that crabs denuded the algae from. So we, I, I put out a bunch of GoPros on the bottom to do some time-lapse surveys and then looked at each of those photos and uh, <clears throat> counted the number of fish per frame, so just individuals per frame, and then the number of species per frame. And there were some stark differences here as well. On reefs to which we did add crabs and they removed algae, there were many, many more fish, just individuals, so much higher abundance of fish. And then also there was almost twice as many species. Um, so just kind of recapping what we have, when we add crabs, we've seen a, a, a massive reduction in algae cover and also potentially a, an increase in, in uh, the richness and abundance of the fish community and also in the number of coral recruits that we get on these patches. Um, so the, the data were too clean, so we decided to replicate the experiment about 20 <laughs> miles away and, and see if we could mess them up a little bit. Um, it's a very similar cluster of patch reefs, um, and it's just outside of a, of a small MPA. Well, I guess they're all small in the Keys, but it's just outside of a special preservation area. Um, and we, we had the exact same uh, treatments, except we added one where we, where we denuded the reefs of algae and did not add crabs, just to see if that was an interesting result. And, uh, and here we, again, we have the, uh, the mean abundance of fish per frame and the mean richness of fishes per frame uh, in these time-lapse surveys. Um, and this is uh, before we did any treatments and, and before anyone asked this, this horrible trend in the data is, is also mimicked, you know, in this, and it ends up being a, a consequence of reef size was a covariant. So, and I have not corrected for that in this figure. So that's why there's this weird shape. But, but you, if you notice the, uh, the trend of, of uh, before and after um, on each of the treatments where algae were removed, um, it's the same. Um, and then we have a, oh, sorry. And the, uh, the differences here are, are due to, due primarily to this six families of fish. These are grunts, snappers, parrotfish, damsels, wrasses, and tangs. Um, and interestingly, <clears throat> at least two of these are major herbivorous groups. Um, we, we saw the same effect in, uh, in the richness of fishes where each treatment that, well, each manipulation we made had a, had a major effect on the, uh, the, both the abundance and richness of fish. Um, so then we asked why, well, why are we seeing this? Um, the effect of, of adding crabs on algae cover is pretty simple, they're eating it. Um, the effect of, of, uh, of crabs on uh, coral recruitment is probably because they're eating the algae and providing um, more and better uh, settlement habitat. Um, on fish diversity, it's a little, little more difficult to tease out. There's definitely probably this, the removal of algae removes that chemical signal that can deter fish um, and the visual signal that can deter fish, but, but maybe those have both been studied. So we looked at this physical effects of algae. Um, and one of the things that we noticed was here on, on one of these reefs and kind of going backwards in time. This is, um, this is an annular, uh, Monta or Bacella, Montastri or whatever it is now. Um, <laughs> and, um, and you can see it's picked clean. This is, this is following, uh, this is about 12 months after we added crabs to it. Um, but before it was stuffed with this, uh, with this dense mat of halomita that we kind of looked at, it was filling in all these interstices and, and homogenizing the reef structure basically and, and, and cutting off all these bolt holes and all kind of stuff. And so we, we thought, you know, maybe, maybe algae are physically homogenizing the reef structure. Maybe algae, when they get this dense, are, are reducing the complexity of these structures and thus reducing their um, utility to fish as habitat. <clears throat> So instead of doing this in the field, we, we pulled it out and looked at it in a mesocosm, uh, where in these four meter diameter pools, uh, we had three block structures and e uh, each structure featured three blocks of, of one of these three uh, physical treatments, where one was a crevice rich block, where one side was open and the other side, I, I embedded a bunch of various diameter PVC pipes uh, in concrete. And then the second one was these algae filled crevices where I took that same block and stuffed it full of algae that we pulled off of the reef. 
And then a third was just uh, blocks that were completely full of concrete. So there were no crevices. <clears throat> um, and then I guess there's a fourth treatment, this open area. Um, <clears throat> and what I did was I, I collected fish uh, from four different families, the grunts, damsels, uh, tangs, and angelfish, because all the other ones really didn't do well either collecting them or, or keeping them in these closed systems or uh, mesocosm systems. So we, we substituted uh, angelfish because they were kind of the next family that, that was important in our, uh, in our field study. Um, and what I did was I pulled these in, put them in a uh, holding tank for about 48 hours to acclimate to, the, to our conditions, and then added them to the, <clears throat> the mesocosm and allowed them another 24 hours to, to acclimate before I started recording their position in the tank as on one of those treatments or, or within the, uh, the open area in the middle, um, every six hours for, for 24 hours. And here are the results during uh, the day. And this is, both of these graphs are gonna be the same way. So we've got the treatment groups along the bottom here, and then the proportion of fish, the mean proportion of fish during that time period that were on each of these, these uh, treatment structures. Um, and during the day was roughly what we expected, where, where the vast majority of them were, were on these open, clean structures. And then, interestingly, a few were, were still hanging out around these uh, algae-filled structures. And then, I mean, the rest was just a wash. Um, we had a similar situation at night. <clears throat> However, there was this interesting shift um, from the proportion that, would, that was on the algae-filled blocks during the during the day to to in the open, and it, it was really kind of cool because we saw a natural behavior that we weren't expecting to see. This difference was due entirely to grunts leaving their structure, either one during uh, during the evening and, and moving around in the open. Um, but the the point is that <clears throat> these these unfilled un algae you know stuffed uh, blocks were were the preferred um, habitat for all the different uh, groups of fish in, in every trial that we ran. Um, so in summary, when we've added crabs to these reefs, we've uh, affected a, a massive reduction in the cover of macroalgae and also seemingly indirectly increases in the richness and abundance of the fish community and also in uh, the recruitment of corals. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the work was permitted by the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary for uh, FWC. Um, and then I could not have done this work without the help of, of quite a few uh, field assistants. Um, and I guess I'm done. <laughs>